My firefighting tool is in bad shape, and today we're going to do something about that. No, you've been a good friend. Don't like those hands there. I'll make you hand, my, make your hand to the king. It wears off, and so just to... What you're looking at is the fabulous Rogue Tool Ho. This is not this is not a traditional firefighting tool, but over the years, as I keep trying all of these different things and all of the traditional tools, what I'm starting to find is that in this area, almost nothing works better than a good quality hoe. If you're not familiar with Rogue Tools, they are an American built company, love Rogue Tools that do a lot of stuff for gardening and they do a lot of wildland firefighting tools as well. But what's so interesting about them is if you look at that shape, that's kind of a concave, concave this way, convex that side. How do you know? I guess it all depends on which side you're standing on. What they're made out of are recycled plow discs. Yeah, this is a typical farming style plow disc. That's what gives them that unique shape and really lends them to, you know, it's a good quality steel. They work really well. But this one here is my new favorite. It's got a nice long 60 inch handle on it. And this has just been the tool that I went to. It's super lightweight. It's good for tall guys because you can get them with the long handles on them and they are fabulous. My previous one that I was using was not this particular one, but it was basically the same thing, was their version of the Pulaski. And you can see, of course, it's got that, that, that shape, you know, right there, the plow disc. Are we gonna focus? Is this the best we can do, Canon? Thank you very much. Problem with this one, this is too heavy. It's too heavy after a long shift, and it's just not necessary when you can do the same thing with a tool that has a long handle and is much lighter weight. But, uh, you know, it all comes down to personal preference. It really does. It's not, this is not the end all be all. But, you know, one interesting fact you may not know is that when the Okies, uh, you know, during the Dust Bowl, the Great Depression, they were not able to farm. And many of them, you know, young single guys loaded up on foot with a knapsack and headed west to try to get work in the fields or in the... California orchards were all the thing. And one tool that, that most of them took with them when they had to make a decision, when they had to have a tool that would provide them an income, what'd they take? They took the garden hoe. And then this is just basically an adaptation of that. So it, it's just such a wonderful tool. And if you haven't used one of these before, uh, it's just amazing the difference, the edge retention, just the design of it, the quality, thick, heavy handles. I mean, compared to your garden variety, big box store, um, hose, you know, I just can't compare, but we have a problem. The problem is this tool has been beat up. Man, we have been busy with wildland fires. Now this video, you may be saying to yourself, well, you know, I'm not doing wildland firefighting. Why do I need this? What we're going to do is I'm just going to basically go through and show you how to properly sharpen tools, which applies to your garden tools, your shovels, anything that you have and look after them, take care of the handles. So they'll serve you a lifetime if you take care of them. And you can see here, this one's been digging in the rocks. Oh man, I'm 4th of July, we had a big party yesterday and lots of people over. Unfortunately, at one o'clock the night before, not last night, but the night before that, pager went off and we were out digging fire line all night until eight o'clock in the morning. So ah, it's been rough. It's been two big fires in the last oh, you know, five days or so. So time to get the tools back in action. One of my pet peeves in life is to grab a wooden handle and have it all checked and cracked. It, just, it does not feel very nice on the hands. It's rough, it gives you blisters, and it's not necessary. I mean, we all do, we all do it. You know, sometimes you leave something outside. But if you have a, a nice tool like this, you know what I find with these nice tools, whether it be, you know, and that's one reason why I'm a big advocate of why, about snap-on tools for my mechanic tools. It's because they, they're expensive, I understand that. They cost so much that they, they're special to you and you took, take care of them, there's, a, there's a, an investment in it. It's the rent versus own philosophy. You know, you know, everyone knows that a house that you own, a condo, whatever it is, is going to be better taken care of than one you rent. You just don't, you don't have a dog in the fight. You don't have a skin in the game. It's a different thing. So when you, when you buy a nice tool like this and you spend hard-earned money on it, you're more likely to take care of it, where you get buy something that's kind of disposable, that's not a great tool, you don't take care of it so well. So in, in my experience, it's better, or it's, it's, a, it's a savings in the long run to buy quality tools because you look after them. 
So once you get a handle that's well seasoned, let's say you've had it for a while like this one, this one here I've had for several years, you don't need to get crazy and do a lot of sanding. What you're basically doing is you're just, you're just kind of, well, I'm just kind of cleaning off the dirt and the grime and the, and the oil from my hands a little bit because we want to put a new coat of boiled linseed on here. And so it, uh, it kind of penetrates into the wood. And I'm just using a, 180 grit sandpaper. Now I've mentioned this before, but if you're a new subscriber, a, a real economical way to buy sandpaper, oh yeah, here, is uh, go to your auto body store where they sell professional equipment and you can get, oh, sorry, this is 320, 320. I buy a roll of 320 and 180 in these rolls. And this one's, well, I've had it for years. They come in a big roll and they've got adhesive on the back. It's for long boards, but they're really great because it sticks to your hands and you can really sand with it. And it just, I, I'm not fine, it, and it's the best quality. See how it sticks to my hand like this here? I don't have to hold on to it, it's wonderful. It's the best quality, and it just lasts a long time, and it's the way to go. So I'm basically just gonna hit all this real quick and get, uh, get all that oil from hands, and you know, of course there's Obanoff on there from my gloves. I treat my gloves with Obanoff so they're comfortable and supple. But that's about it. We don't need much more than that. Now I'll pay a little special attention to the ends there. You know, the end grain, they have a tendency of cracking. They have this funny little, I don't know what it is. I don't like the round end on the shovel or a tool like that. Well, I like it on a shovel, okay. But I don't, on my rakes, I don't, I like to have it flat. <laughs> so I, I cut it off, cut it off flat and put a bevel on it. But I keep that sanded there and I like to put, that way I can put lots of boiled linseed oil in there, really soak it in, it really sucks it in the end grain because wood is like a series of tubes, like a series of straws. When we cross cut, we sever those straws and then it'll really drink in a lot of oil in there. It's good for it. I've been a big fan of Rogue Tools for a long time because there's so much detail to put in that they put into them. Not only are they American made, but I mean, just for example, look at the handle, you know, most people, that they're just going to have just a straight handle with no taper in it. But if you follow, look at the lines and follow it down there, you'll see that it's, there's a lot of work that goes into that to taper a handle like that. And it's little things like that that protect your hands from fatigue or your arms. It, it gives you just a little bit of, of a kind of the a fawn's, you know, not typically, not a fawn's foot like an ax, but it means you just have to grip the tool with, with less effort and less energy. And it's those little things that just make your life a little bit better at the end of a long day. So with our handle all sanded, we're gonna put a nice coat of, boy, these gloves are not very good, a boiled linseed oil. Boiled linseed oil is, can be found at any hardware store. You can, boy, these are the worst gloves. I need to get some proper nitrite gloves. I put on six, it's useless. It's just useless. I'm gonna keep going here. I mean, <laughs> I get one of these gloves on. They're so fragile. All right, we got a blue glove on, thank goodness. All right, so how often your tools, your hand tools, garden tools, shovels, anything with a wooden handle, axes, how much do you, oops, oh, that's way too much. That's kind of wasteful there. Anyway, uh, you just need a little bit on there, but what the old timer said was, uh, let's say you have a raw handle, right? It's uh, uh, once a day for a week, and then, uh, what is it? Once a week for a month, once a month for a year, and then after that, annually, once a year. Don't, don't neglect those ends there. Nice thing about this, if you do this once a year, you get such a nice, rich luster of the wood. I mean, it, it just will just last you forever. Don't keep it out of the sun. Don't, don't leave your tools out in the sun if you can help it. Put them in the shade. They don't need to be, I need some better gloves. They don't need to be uh, in your house or anything, but they do need to be kept out of the sun. So after a good liberal coat of boiled linseed oil, don't, we're not gonna wipe it off. We're gonna let that sit for a while and we'll take a, we'll get to work on the our edge of our tool and our filing and then we'll wipe that boil. We don't want to leave that boiled linseed oil on there. It gets a, 
it dries into kind of a resin that's really hard to get off and it's all lumpy. It's not nice to work with, but we'll leave it on there, there for another 15 minutes or so while we take a look at this edge. So close up, you can see here, it's in pretty bad shape. It's been in the rocks, but the thing that always mar marvels me, or that's such a mar I marvel over is the quality of steel over those discs. Even though you're swinging on the long end of that long handle with all that leverage into the rocks and chopping and all that, they're incredible how well they hold up. So they don't need a ton of work, but we're just gonna use just a regular file. Give me up here, we got just a, uh, a mill bastard file there, kind of a, I like a finer pattern. This is pretty typical. This is, I think this is a government issue right here, one that the Forest Service, yeah, this is the one that they gave me for filing tools. And it's a, a that's a great file. They wanna maintain the angle. We don't wanna change the angle too much. And we can really tell as you come across here, Maybe you can see better here. If you come across and you see that you're cutting here, then you know your angle is, is too, too shallow. And if you come across and you're only touching down there, you can see that your angle is too deep. And so you're using that as a guide to kind of come, come across there and adjust the angle of your file until you're cutting straight across that bevel. Because that bevel that they have on there is pretty good. In a good file like this, it won't take long, as you can see. To clean all that up. A tool like this for, for, that, for the common you know, garden use, yard use is, is gonna probably last you a lifetime. Fighting fire with it, you know, maybe it's gonna wear out. I mean, you're gonna file it a lot and eventually it'll get too short, it's not, use, not useful anymore. But uh, you see all those, those rough areas there? We want to get rid of those. It causes us more work. And we'll just keep filing and bringing that whole bevel back, maintaining our angle until those are, whoops, until those are gone. Remember when you're filing, your file only cuts on the forward pole, lift it up, don't drag it backwards so you ruin your file, only on the forward pole. Now a file card is good to use to keep the file clean. If you don't have one, you can come across to your pants. Don't do this on your church pants. On your nice, on your work pants, and you can keep it clean that way as well. Now I've got most of those damaged areas filed, filed out of there. Now this is gonna be the same process. You know, whatever tool you have, garden tool you're gonna have, it's a little bit more tricky with these because they have that concave, convex shape to them but I'm gonna clean up from the bottom and hold my tool, my file flat to the bottom and, and work that edge. Watch this wire come up. You see it? You see that, that wire that's been bent over? I don't want that. I wanna get that, get that off of there and smooth out that bottom the best I can. Now you should be able to see that wire sticking up there. Now I'm gonna take this and just work that last little bit, get those, those, imp those uh, damaged areas out. Now that's looking really good. So we could just take a piece of that sandpaper that we had left over from our handle filing and just, just clean that up. This is not a precision cutting instrument, but it, uh, we want it to be sharp, smooth as possible, get that wire off there. The wire will come soon enough, soon as you, off soon enough, soon as you put it in the ground, but you know, we'll do things the best we can, right? That looks good. Less likely, I'll give you a wicked um, splinter, sliver. Man, splinter, sliver. I think it's geographical, I don't know which one's correct. Which one's metal, which one's wood? But that puts a nice, nice clean polish on there. Gets that off, that wire off there. You know, something about tool, about, I'll, t I'll tell you an interesting story I heard uh, from a guy, I think this, I didn't know him, but I think I read this in a book somewhere. Uh, a guy back in the day that used to hire men for wildland fire crews. You know, guys would show up and he didn't know one guy from the next. So he had a quick, a simple method to determine what type of a man he wanted on his crew. And he did it by simply looking at their boots. So he'd have all these guys, these, these recruits, line up in a line. And he'd walk down the line and he'd look at their boots. And he would, he could tell, or he claimed he could tell a lot about a guy on not only the choice that he made of his footwear, 
but also how well he took care of them, how well he looked after them. And he claimed that he knew his man simply by looking at the boots that he wore, what his choice was, and how well they were looked after. And, you know, I, I'll never, I never forget that when I am, uh, you know, when I might be put in a position to, you know, be a squad boss or, you know, it happens from time to time that I head up a hand crew, that it, the guys come to me uh, from all different agencies and all different backgrounds, guys I've never met before. I do look at their boots. I certainly look at their boots, but I also look at their tool. And, you know, not everyone's going to have their own tool. And I'm starting to see more and more of it. Guys are deciding that, you know, sometimes the tools you get in the, your agency tools are, depending on the agency, are not particularly maintained well or not in good order. And uh, a lot of guys I'm starting to see are, are taking their own tools and, and looking after them and making a choice what works best for them, getting a tool that fits their body type. And that's the case for me. And I don't want to... A lot of these tools are made for with re, that are for the forest from the forest service such are made with really short handles, and it's um, I feel discriminated against because you know I'm I'm taller than the average person you know I'm you know, six foot three six foot four, so these tools have to be able to be made for for someone as small as you know five foot one five foot two I've seen short people on the fire tall people on the fire, and so they try to find something that accommodates everyone, and what ends up is it doesn't accommodate me very well because it's just too small. So having my own tool that I can look after, that I've sharpened and I know I can trust, that's designed for a tall guy like me, it's a, it makes a huge difference. And so I, I take it pretty seriously. So, I mean, it's not common that you're going to run into a guy or a woman that has their own tool, but you can tell a lot from the agency, at least kind of the spirit of the agency, of how well that they... How well they look, by how well they look after their tools, if they're sharp, if they're in good order, if I see that they're boiling, put boiled linseed on the handles, um, it tells me a lot. It tells me a lot about that, that, that agency and that organization. And before we finish up that handle, we'll take that you know, remaining sandpaper and go along here and clean off the dirt, rust, whatever, because we're going to put a protective coat of ballastol on here. And it won't, you know, won't penetrate, get into the pores of the metal if it's got a bunch of, bunch of grime on it. Grime. Don't keep your, when you, and also when you're using your sandpaper on your wood handles or woodworking, what, don't you, don't, don't try to make it last too long. You know, once it starts cutting, get rid of it. Get another piece. Is it just causes frustration. It causes you to work harder. And uh, get rid of it. Get a new piece and keep moving, moving forward. Boy, that's looking nice, isn't it? That is nice. Puts a nice polish on it, that sandpaper. All right, now we can hit boiled linseed oil. Oil has been sitting on there for, for a while. We can take a shop towel, wipe it all clean off. Boy, that is so nice. That just looks so nice. It just, everyone's happy. The wood handle's happy. I'm happy. The boiled linseed oil's happy. Man, that is a good looking tool. I'll tell you what, I see it. One of you guys on my crew with a tool like this, I'll make you, hand, make you hand to the king. Look at that. Does that not look nice? Even the grain orient, orientation is correct. That is attention to detail. Good job, Rogue. But look at the luster on that. Nothing more satisfying than the tool you've had a long time that, you've, you, that you just cannot, you cannot rush that patina. It just happens over years and use. Isn't that beautiful? That's a, you're gonna leave that. You're gonna leave that tool out outside in the yard in the sun. No, you're not. You're gonna look after it, and it's gonna serve you well. It's gonna serve your family well. It's worth the investment. Let's take a look at the edge. How it turned out. That's what you want. We got all those dents out of there. Doesn't that look good? That tool's ready for work. Nice and smooth, that 320 sandpaper, 180, 320. Doesn't it, both is is fine for this type of work. It's nice to have both. If you're going to order, might order one of each roll, roll of each. It covers about everything. But smooth to the touch. It's going to be a good cutter. And, you know, it's going to get beat up. It's going to be in the rocks again. But uh, we'll keep after it, and it'll make our work easier and nicer. Not there. That's a fine tool right there. That is a fine tool. So the last thing we're going to do is we're going to put a nice uh, film of protective oil on it. 
And a product that I've used for, I guess, four, three or four years now that I really like is, is Ballastol. Uh, I know a lot of guys like to use this on, the, on their guns. It's been around a long time. And it's non-carcinogenic and it's skin safe and it's just not to it's toxic. It's not gonna put your liver into overdrive like a lot of the petrochemical type of protectants. And not to say that they won't work, but I, you know, we, we, with all of the, uh, increase of, of cancer and all of these issues and all that it makes you kind of makes you wonder you know if it's not somewhat environmental are there some of the things that we're using or or having our homes just being inundated with chemicals that are causing that i don't know i'm not a doctor but uh, i like to try to limit my exposure to those things as much as possible so this is a great product and i cover all my chisels and everything with it and so also uh, all of these things files and the tools that i recommend the things that i really like to use uh, ballast dolls while I keep in my Amazon store and you can go and see that so it gives you kind of a way that you can support the channel and you can um, and get the products that, that I really stand behind. I only put things in there that I that I've used myself and that I really uh, um, stand behind so go to wranglermart.com and I'll take you there and you can check out some of those things. So ballast doll as you know uh, keep it in a little little jar or a little something with a rag use a silicone rag here so you don't waste it pour it in there once in a while and then, and it's real easy just to put a nice coat on all the metal, the exposed area. I mean, it, they come painted, but the paint wears off. And so just to just wipe it off, it helps, it keeps it cleaner, keeps the, the dirt and the grime from sticking to it as much. And anything metal like that, you know, you can just take it and, and just rub it on there. Just put a nice coat on there. It's just del del delightful, delightful stuff. It doesn't take long. And there you go. We got a tool. It's ready for work. All right. There's only one thing we're lacking, and that's the sheath. But that's for the next video. We'll see you guys. Uh, we'll see you guys on the sheath video. Good morning. Oh, it's July fifth, two thousand sixteen, the day after Fourth of July. I hope you guys had a good Fourth of July weekend. We had a great time. We had a pretty good party at the homestead. We, Mrs. W and I, pushed really hard to get things somewhat livable. Uh, we're getting close now, but everything turned out great. We had uh, probably a little over 30 people over, lots of kids, archery contest. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. I was pretty tired actually the night before, uh, one o'clock in the morning. This is the night before 4th of July. The pager went off again on another big fire to the east of here. And we spent all night digging line and and burning out, and I got home at 8 o'clock and fortunately had a couple hours of nap, but uh, I'm definitely caught up now. But man, oh man, it is turning out to be a, a pretty hectic fire season, and and we're just getting started. But we made it through 4th of July without any ma major incidents. So, Mrs. W saw something cool yesterday. Saw a whole herd of elk in the lower pasture. If you look right down there, you're looking right at my window, just to the right of the wind meter, and there they were. I didn't get them on video, but I uh, uh, have seen their tracks, so maybe we'll get them next time. As you know, or maybe you don't know, you should know, Mother Earth News Fair, West Bend, Wisconsin, and the Wrangler Star family will be there this coming weekend. So if you live in the area, please come out. And I've got the winners. Five of you, well, lucky winners, have received weekend passes to the Mother Earth News Fair. We'll be having a book signing. We'll be uh, the whole family will be there. We're, we're there to to meet uh, uh, folks and and uh, come on out. We invite you. It's a, it's a wonderful fair and it's well worth it. So quickly, the winners are Catfish Hunter twenty four twenty four, Leslie Oaks, Patrick Malone, Sam Hayes, and Mitchell Reed. If you've heard your name called, send me an email at wranglerstardiy at gmail .com. I will need your emails, so respond with those. And we'll have those tickets for you at Will Call. So please respond ASAP. And uh, if I don't hear from you in 24 hours or so, I'll need to pick some altern alternates, alternates, alternative, some other people. One last thing also is uh, if there's anyone that would uh, be willing to step up and arrange a meet and greet. This could be for Saturday evening or Sunday evening. I think either one will work. Probably Saturday evening would work best. Uh, where we could, yeah, you could put something together, a venue, usually anywhere from 70 to 120, 150 people show up. Um, we would, we will be available. So it's, um, I just don't know the area. It's difficult for us to organize those things. And we just, 
we have too much going on with the fair. But if there's someone that wants to wants to do that, has the ability to do it, uh, you can contact me again at the same email, and um, we can make those arrangements. I'd love to do it. Uh, that way for for us to hang out and get to know one another, and it's something that we always uh, really enjoy. So if you're that person, let me know. And finally, before I close, I want to, uh, if you guys could do me a favor and go in the comments and give a big hearty thank you to Mrs. W., for all the work she does behind the scenes that that maybe you guys ha, don't, don't know about. But it really is her uh, that allows me to be able to continue to put up daily or almost near daily content. And she has she makes great sacrifices and, and carries a lot of weight and, and it frees up the time for me to do that. And I'm really grateful. And if you would take a moment to just uh, give a word of thanks and encouragement to her, I know that uh, I would appreciate it and I know she would as well. Um, so, so there, that's it. <laughs> all right. We'll, uh, hopefully we'll see all you Wisconsinites, uh, this weekend and I guess that's it. So thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next video.